Therefore, it is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The people of Ontario will pay for this government's loss of the Windstream lawsuit for years and years to come. The $28 million judgment is just the tip of the iceberg. The tribunal stated that the $5.2 billion contract is still valid and in force. That means the Liberals have two choices. Build the project and pay out $5.2 billion or enter into settlement negotiations to try to convince Windstream to take less. Either way, Ontario is on the hook for billions. Mr. Speaker, when do the Liberals plan on handing over $5.2 billion to Windstream? Mr. Speaker, is this gas plant 2.0? Mr. Speaker, um, I, I appreciate the question from the uh, the member opposite, and as I have, uh, as I've said, we can confirm that we uh, that we have the uh, been advised of the tribunal's decision. And what's interesting is that the tribunal dismissed the majority of claims made against Canada and Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Um, the final award was significantly less than the damages being sought by Windstream, Mr. Speaker. And uh, Ontario is reviewing the uh, the decision. Officials are reviewing the decision, and we understand that Canada is doing the same in order to, uh, to determine next steps. Um, it's interesting, Mr. Speaker, as I hear the, the heckling from the other side. Oh, I caught it. The member from Renfrew, come to order. Carry on, please. Taking a, a cautious and a responsible approach, Mr. Speaker, to offshore wind to allow for the development of research and uh, coordination, particularly, particularly in the area of uh, decommissioning requirements and noise over Answer. water, Mr. Speaker. So we're looking for evidence and uh, research in those areas. Mr. Speaker, uh, back to the Premier. Not only will we be on the hook for billions of dollars because this government had to save two Liberal seats. And not only are we going to have to pay $28 million to Windstream already, there's untold millions of dollars spent fighting this case, the legal cost involved with this. We know the Canadian government sent 10 representatives to the tribunal at a cost of $8 million in legal fees. Ontario sent 20 representatives to the tribunal. It's, face to, it's, it's fair to assume the cost will be significantly more. So my question to the Premier, you may not want to talk about the $5.2 billion, but at least tell the legislature, tell the people of Ontario how much you've spent in legal costs, how, how much taxpayer dollars have been spent fighting this Windstream contract that you mistakenly committed Ontario to. Minister of Energy. Appreciate it, please. Very good. Uh, Minister of Energy. Oh. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm very happy to uh, to rise and uh, uh, outline, um, you know, to the uh, leader of the opposition what truly is happening right now. And Ontario is carefully reviewing the decision, and we understand that uh, the federal government is doing the same in order to determine next steps, Mr. Speaker. It's been less than a week that uh, the uh, that we've been advised. Not very good. Let's bring it down, please. Finish. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So Ontario has been advised of the uh, tribunal's decision in NAFTA Chapter 11 dispute between Windstream uh, and Canada, and uh, the, the the tribunal dismissed the majority of claims, with the final 25 million being uh, significantly less than the what was uh, originally sought, Mr. Speaker. But when it comes to uh, dollars and wanting to know the amount, when they want us to rip up contracts, Mr. Speaker, that's billions and billions and billions of dollars, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to know what their amount is, Mr. Speaker because they don't have a plan. I'm, uh, I'm seeking some assistance from members to uh, allow me to hear the complete answer or the complete question. I may have to make a decision to move to areas that you know I don't like, but I will. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. First, it was the the complete botching of the OESP and paying $9 million in consultants instead of helping low-income families pay their hydro bills. Now it's millions and millions of dollars spent to lose a lawsuit that cost us $28 million so far. 
and, and, and likely to be significantly more down the road. Why won't the Liberals tell us how much they spent? We know the federal government spent $8 million on legal fees. We know Ontario had a much bigger delegation. I couldn't get the answer from the Minister of Energy. I'll ask the Premier again. How much did this government, how much did, how much did the Premier's government spend on legal fees trying to fight this foolish commitment that this Premier has made once again on energy? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think it's important to, uh, to let the Leader of the Opposition know that we're still reviewing the, the decision, and it's really too early to jump to conclusions. The member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound come to order, and I have two others in my mind. If they say it again, we'll go to you. Carry on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, you know what? We're going to let um, you know, it, it take its course, Mr. Speaker. The member from Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. And because of that, we'll move to warnings. Thank you. As soon as I sit, the member from Glengarry, Prescott Russell, is warned. Anyone else? Thank you. Finish. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So we're very proud of renewable energy on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker. Unlike the pro coal party on that side, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to ensure that we invest and do the right thing when it comes to uh, renewable energy in this province, Mr. Speaker. But you know, I know the um, the uh, the leader of the opposition talked about the OESP program and the OEB, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. The OESP program is actually doing great work. We're actually helping 145,000 families, Mr. Speaker, with 21 million dollars in benefits so far, and that's only in 10 months, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The Auditor General revealed that Ontario overpaid by $9.2 billion for renewable energy contracts. That's the Auditor General being very specific, specific an overpayment of $9.2 billion. We also know the Ontario Liberal Party received $1.3 million in donations from 30 companies that received renewable energy contracts. So, Mr. Speaker, my question is straightforward to the Premier, and I realize it may be uncomfortable for her to answer, but why did Ontario pay, overpay by $9.2 billion for renewable energy contracts that every single Ontarian is now paying on their hydro bill? Please. Please. You're making America great again. The member from Nepean Carlton is warned. Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know the Minister of Energy is going to want to uh, speak to uh, this question. Um, you know, Mr. Speaker, we made, a, we made a decision to complete the shutdown of all of the coal-fired plants in Ontario, and we made a decision to replace that uh, energy with clean, clean electricity, Mr. Speaker. The electricity grid is 90 per cent emissions-free in Ontario. And I know the heckling, the heckling on the other side is coming from a party that wouldn't have done that doesn't believe in it, doesn't believe in clean energy, Mr. Speaker, would take us back to coal generation, Mr. Speaker. We know that having no smog days is in the best interest of every person in this province, but especially, Mr. Speaker, it's in the best interest of kids who are growing, whose lungs are growing, growing kids who might have uh, asthma. It's an incredibly important, it's an incredibly important initiative that we have taken, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it is our responsibility to remove pollution. Thank from you. the air. We've done. Thank you. Stop the clock, please. You see it, please. please. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, it, again to the Premier, I know it's the Liberal talking points to say this is about coal. It's not about coal. The Progressive Conservatives announced the phase out of coal. This is about an overpayment of $9.2 billion. This is about the Liberal Party accepting $1.3 million in donations. I'm tired of the diversions. I'm tired of the Liberal speaking points. People in Ontario are struggling, and they seem right. oblivious to it. Mr. Speaker, $12 million to pay for high-priced consultants and ads for 
for the OESP. Untold millions of dollars spent fighting the Windstream lawsuit, overpaying $9.2 billion that's on our bills now. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to Liberal energy policies, my question is this. Why is it always Liberal lawyers, Liberal consultants and friends that get rich while the people of Ontario are stuck with question. higher and higher hydro bills? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you say it, please? Thank you. Premier. Mr. Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to rise and answer the opposition's uh, question once again. Because you know what, the the, the leader of the opposition, uh, it makes it very clear that they would have, you know, wouldn't have built any new supply, Mr. Speaker. That they would have continued to left the system crumbling, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that when we have a blackout like we did in 2003. The member from Oxford is warned, and the Minister of Transportation is warned. And there's a couple of others. Uh, they're up here. Mr. Speaker, back in 2003, we didn't have enough generation. We didn't have enough capacity. So we, when we took over, Mr. Speaker, we had to build that capacity, and we made sure, Mr. Speaker, that we built that capacity, making it free. I'll play this all day. The member from. Hamilton East Stony Creek is warned. Carry on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So we're very proud that we've made a green system. We've eliminated coal, Mr. Speaker. We no longer have to send out uh, uh, warnings to families right across the province telling them that they don't have to go outside to breathe, Mr. Speaker. That's something that we should all be proud of. Unfortunately, proud. this government uh, is very proud of it. The opposition is not. We know they're the pro-coal party, Mr. Yes, Speaker, because they want to continue to find cheaper ways to make electricity, Speaker. We understand that some families Thank are you. struggling. We've got programs to help. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, back to the Premier. You know, the the Minister of Energy says they're helping. They got programs that are helping. Well, let's let's talk about their programs. There are still 355,000 low-income families in Ontario that have yet to receive the Ontario Electricity Support Program. Stop the clock. No, no, sorry. Start the clock. The Deputy Premier is warned. The member from Kitchener-Waterloo is warned. Finish, please. So, Mr. Speaker, to talk about the programs. Because they spent so much on consultants rather than helping low-income families, 350,000 low-income families in Ontario that were meant to get this help aren't getting it. And then there's the 1.2 million rural families in Ontario that, that the Liberals have excluded from the rural or remote rate protection. What kind of help is this? The only people that I can see that are being helped by this government's foolish question. energy policies are Pennsylvania or Michigan or New York. My question to the Premier is, when are you going to stop making America great and make Ontario Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I know the leader of the opposition keeps quoting Donald Trump because he believes in Donald Trump's philosophy, Mr. Speaker. But on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, we do not lump Trump's hate, Mr. Speaker. And what we've done, Mr. Speaker, is make sure that we've invested in programs like the OESP program. In 10 months, Mr. Speaker, in 10 months, 145,000 families have been helped by the OESP program. We don't believe that's enough, Mr. Speaker, so we've budgeted $225 million to get as many of them as possible onto this program. Mr. Speaker, this is a great program to ensure that every, every MPP actually promotes this. And I know when I was at AMO, there was opposition party mayors that were coming from their ridings and they said they didn't know about the program, Mr. Speaker. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make sure that my ministry sends to every MPP these OESP programs again so they can ensure that these families get on this program when they need it. Can you say that, please? Thank you. I, I, I think I've made it kind of clear that I want a semblance of respect here. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. 
My question is for the Premier. Will the Premier rule out privatizing some or all of Ontario's e-health assets? Thank you. Mr. Mr. Speaker, we've been very clear. I've been clear. The Deputy Premier has been clear. The Minister of Energy has been clear. That uh, the, Minister, the Minister of Health has been clear. He's been clear too. The Minister of Health has been clear. We are. We are not selling uh, e-health, Mr. Speaker. We are not selling uh, people's patients' personal health, personal health information, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there have been millions of dollars that have been invested in digital uh, medical uh, uh, initiatives in this province through e-health, Mr. Speaker. And we need to understand the value of that. We need to understand how we can improve service to patients. That's what this is about. That's what the Minister of Health has asked, uh, has asked Ed Clark to give us advice on, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, yesterday the Liberals said they would be valuing our digital health assets, and after valuing, they would be leveraging them. Speaker, that's what the Liberals said yesterday in this chamber. It sounds a lot, a lot like what the Liberal plan was for Hydro One, which the Premier called unlocking value and leveraging our assets. Speaker. How many private companies has Ed Clark or the government spoken to about being either a private partner in our e-health services or purchasing our assets? <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, um, the leader of the third party might know that Canada Health Infoway has estimated roughly a billion dollars in annual benefits to Ontario as a result of uh, the investments that have been made in e-health, Mr. Speaker, and almost six billion dollars in cumulative benefits since 2007. Uh, it's important that we undertake this review so that we can better understand the value of the digital assets as we move toward a new vision for digital health in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. The mandate of e-health expires in uh, 2017, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, and um, you know, I, I've mentioned in this house before that Ed Clark also uh, conducted uh, important work to improve the LCBO and beer store to maximize the value of our assets, Mr. Speaker. And that's what's happened. There's been no sell-off of the LCBO, Mr. Speaker. And I know the leader of the third party that will say that that's very different than eHealth, and it is different. But in terms of an asset that's owned Answer. by the people of Ontario, it is the same thing, Mr. Speaker. How do we make sure that we understand the the value, and how do we make sure that we maximize the value of that for the people of Ontario. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, if the government wants to improve e-health, they should improve excuse me, e-health. But it's not what the Premier has said. Nothing that uh, Ed Clark has said and nothing that the minister has said that it explains why they need to open or to provide the open market value to find out the open market value of our e-health assets in order to improve it. Nothing that she has said, the Premier, nothing that the Minister has said, nothing that Ed Clark has said tells us why they need to know this open market value. And she continues to not answer that question today, Speaker. Has Ed Clark or anyone else been given instructions to talk to private companies about private partnerships to provide e-health services or the private op operation of parts of Question. our e-health system. Mr. of Health and Long-Term Care. Mr. of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, we are not selling or privatizing e-health or Ontarians' personal health records. Yes. Full stop. Period. Period. We are not selling e-health, and I, I can't understand why the uh, leader of the third party doesn't realize the value as Canada Health Infoway has to actually look at the investments made. So with a mandate due to end uh, at the end of 2017, with incredible opportunity in the digital health realm, including uh, in this province, looking at the investments that we've made, where 80 percent of family doctors are using electronic medical records, most of our diagnostics Answer. are digitized. We have incredible opportunity. It behooves us, quite frankly, to have an expert like Ed Hart Clark look at the assets, look at how we can actually Thank improve you. upon the system that we've created. Yeah. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, the answers did not make me feel very confident. My next question is also for the Premier. 
When the Premier decided to privatize Hydro One, uh, Hydro One was given a $2.6 billion tax holiday by the Liberals. A $2.6 billion tax holiday was given to Hydro One when the Liberals privatized it. Hydro One wants to keep the benefit of that tax holiday for its investors. New Democrats think that that tax holiday, that $2.6 billion, speaker, should benefit Ontarians who are struggling with their hydro costs. Will the Premier ensure that this $2.6 billion tax break goes to Ontario rate payers and not to private investors? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I know the Minister of Finance is going to want to uh, weigh in on this on the uh, supplementary, but Mr. Speaker, let me just let me just say this: that the leader of the third party does not support the investments that we are making in infrastructure, roads, bridges, transit, as a result of the decisions that we have made, Mr. Speaker, including including the broadening of the ownership of Hydro One. She doesn't support those investments. She doesn't support, I suppose, by extension, the economic growth that we are seeing in this province as a result of those investments, Mr. Speaker. Ontario is one of the leaders in the country in terms of economic growth, Mr. Speaker. We're outstripping other provinces, other states, uh, OEC, um, uh, European, uh, North American uh, jurisdictions, and, and G7 countries. So, Mr. Speaker, the, the growth that we are seeing as a result of the plan that we are implementing, including investment in infrastructure, is not something that the leader of the third party supports, Mr. Speaker, but she should. Thank you. Yeah. Speaker, nobody believes what this Premier says at the best of times, and they're certainly not going to believe that. But what they want to hear is what's going to happen to the $2.6 billion. Speaker. That's what I'm asking this Premier to come clean about with the people of this province. Hydro One's annual report says that keeping this $2.6 billion tax gift will, and I quote, result in net cash savings over the next five years due to the reduction of cash, cash taxes payable by Hydro One. End quote. They warn their shareholders in their annual report, in the same report, that the OEB could actually force them to ensure that the benefit of this $2.6 billion actually goes to rates, rate payers instead of private for-profit shareholders. So the question, question. is, is the Premier going to stand uh, with Hydro One's private investors, or are they going to stand with the people of Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. And the reference is made as to how we were proceeding to facilitate uh, greater value for a corporation owned by the province and the people of Ontario, which we still retain, by the way, at this point, and we will continue to always be the largest shareholder benefiting uh, from those endeavors. Furthermore, uh, the, uh, the exemptions that were put in place were in lieu of taxes, which are still then going to be net benefited to the province. So the member opposite makes reference to the transaction that enabled us to maximize our value. At the same time, uh, with the OEB independently will continue to foster and look at uh, those rates, which, by the way, was zero increases uh, this time around, recognizing the tremendous uh, opportunities that Hydro One and others yes, have been able to, to be more efficient in their systems. And of course, that will also benefit ratepayers in the end and all of Ontario. Yes. Thank you. Final supplementary. The Liberal privatization speaker of Hydro One means that Hydro One is definitely getting this $2.6 billion tax break. The uh, Minister of Finance just acknowledged that. The OEB is absolutely going to decide whether that benefits Ontarians or whether that is going to benefit private investors. The government can issue a directive today. In fact, I'm asking the government straight up today to commit to putting a directive forward to the OEB so that the savings of Hydro One that they're getting for that tax break, that $2.6 billion, is actually directed to the benefit of Ontario ratepayers and not to the benefit of private investors. Will they make that commitment to the people of Ontario today? So, Mr. Speaker, the transaction that ensued as a result of that very exemption 
all of it is going to the benefit of infrastructure and investments to be made by the province of Ontario to build new roads and infrastructure. It's going directly into the Trillium Trust for the benefit of all Ontarians and the people of Ontario. The member opposite should know that, and if she doesn't, she should see how the transaction trans transacted occurred so that we could reinvest those proceeds in other act uh, activities and other projects. Again, something that the member opposite in that party has no plan to ensue, and we will, Mr. Speaker, reinvest those monies dollar for dollar Thanks, for the purposes of making greater assets and greater returns for the province of Ontario. New question. The member from Leeds, Grindle. Well, thanks, Speaker. My question is to the uh, Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Speaker, a so-called regionalization scheme to slash Ontario Trillium Foundation's catchment areas from 16 to just five continues. Already, Trillium is allowing its 16 grant review teams yeah. to wither away. Yeah. These volunteers are the program's heart and soul, who truly understand their communities. The minister should know that her ministry's memorandum of understanding with Trillium requires those teams to have at least 18 members. But according to the agency's website, only Toronto now has the minimum. The average of the others is just nine. Speaker, will the minister tell Trillium to stop downsizing by stealth and uphold its agreement by acting to fill those vacancies? Mr. Speaker, thank you, and I want to thank the honourable member for his question. Speaker, the reason I want to thank him is because I know that he knows, as I do, that Trillium remains one of the most important mechanisms in our country for funding the not-for-profit sector and for building capacity in organizations right across our province. That's why, Speaker, on this side of the House, we're investing in the Trillium Foundation. We've held the funding steady, and in fact, Speaker, I'm proud to say that next year, with our 150th anniversary on the horizon, we're investing even more in programs and projects across this province. Speaker. So, if the, if the honourable member wants to have a conversation, Speaker, about his ideas on how we can make a ro more robust infrastructure, I'm happy to listen to them. We can have that conversation. We remain committed to Trillium. We are filling those vacancies of pace, Speaker, in our local communities and those local grant teams. And I look forward to the supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, back to the minister, Speaker. I raised this with the previous minister, and he was obviously surprised by what was going on. And it's full steam ahead under this minister's watch. Grant review teams are being starved of volunteers yeah, yeah. critical to ensuring granting decisions have the most local impact. Multiple catchment areas have no local staff yeah. to help volunteer groups navigate the application process. So if the minister doesn't believe me that this is wrong, I ask her to talk to frontline staff. They know their hands-on work with agencies cannot be replaced by a 1-800 number. Trillium wants to this plan finalized by April, Speaker, but it can't happen unless this minister signs off. Speaker, will the minister commit to maintaining Trillium's local roots by pledging not to sign a new MOU with fewer than 16 catchment areas? You know, Speaker, the only thing, again, I'm happy to take the, minister, the opposite, uh, member to opposite's question. The only thing that surprises me, Speaker, and people on this side of the House is that the honourable member would ask that kind of question when he knows full well that this government has been committed to the Ontario Trillium Foundation for years and will continue to do so. That commitment remains strong, Speaker, and our local grant teams are critically important, as the honourable member knows. Why? Because they give us the kind of local advice that helps us and helps them to make the critical investment decisions that further the work of our, of our not for Province sector. Finally, Speaker, I just want to tell the House that as a former Trillium-funded organization and a leader of a non-for-profit organization that benefited from the Ontario Trillium Foundation, I, my ministry, our entire government are committed to see those local teams remaining strong and in place so that we can continue to fund a robust non-for-profit yes, sector. That's what we're doing on this side of the House, Speaker. Thank you very much. Can you say it, please? Can you say it, please? Thank you. New question. The member from Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Speaker, Premier. When you're waiting in pain for, no. for knee surgery, you should be able to look at the official government wait time for surgery website and trust that what is written there is actually accurate. But the good people in London and across southwestern Ontario know that they can't trust those numbers. They are waiting months longer than the government will admit or publish for the surgeries that they need. In fact, local surgeons say that the real time for hip and knee surgery in London are twice as long as what the ministry published data online states. 
Why does the Premier think that it is right to publish surgical wait time that are not accurate? Health and long-term care. Minister of Health, long-term care. As well, you know, I know that, uh, that the member opposite is talking about uh, there are different aspects, obviously, uh, once a uh, decision has been made to refer to a specialist, uh, um, and that individual may or may not require surgery at the end of that visit with a specialist, and then the, there is a separate period of time if the decision by the specialist, by that frontline clinician, is made uh, that uh, surgery is warranted, then there is a period of time, obviously, that uh, ensues prior to that operation taking place. Uh, so it is important for uh, all of us, I think, to recognize that that it is largely at the discretion of the frontline clinician and specialist to determine the level of priority for both of those uh, situations. So we are working closely with our frontline providers, but we're also in, in investing incredible amounts of money, $2 billion, only on wait times to bring them down to be yes, able sir. to provide more hip and knee surgeries and other types of surgeries. We've in invested in the last decade approximately more than uh, roughly $2 billion, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Thank you, Speaker. I know exactly how wait time is calculated in Ontario, and so do the uh, surgeons in London. And the, uh, what you have on your website is not accurate. In Northern Ontario or throughout Ontario, people should not have to wait 200, 300, 400 days for the surgery. It just should not be happening. But in London, after the surgeon says that, yes, you need a hip and knee surgery, after the clocks start ticking for this uh, website uh, wait time, the government says you will wait seven months. But every surgeon in London knows that it will be at least 11 months before you will get your hip or knee surgery. Will the Premier stop publishing inaccurate wait time and, even more importantly, make sure that the people get access to surgery in a timely manner? Well, I know the member opposite understands the difference that I described earlier between wait ones and wait twos, and it is important. It's critically important that we reduce both of those waiting mm. periods, and we're doing that. But I have to recall uh, from the Fraser Institute, and I think if the Fraser Institute is saying this, we uh, not only need to be surprised, but I think we can appreciate uh, with confidence what they're saying. They, they've given us straight A's in their Wait Time Alliance report card in five key service areas, including hip replacement surgery, knee replacement surgery, cataract procedures, cancer ra radiation, and coronary artery bypass graft. Is there more work to be done? Of course there is. Are we looking at wait times, including their measurement? Yes, we are. I need to remind that party, as well as the PC party, that neither party measured any weights at all when they were in government. Yeah. Wow. We're doing it. We're at the top of the list in terms of the shortest wait times in this Answer. country, and we're continuing to improve, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Yeah. New question, the member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. On Tuesday, the minister was in Ottawa for a very important event, marking an historic moment for Canada, the province of Ontario, and the Algonquins of Ontario. Now, we've heard that, unlike many First Nations, the Algonquins of Ontario never entered into a formal treaty with the Crown, with a claim dating back 250 years. The Algonquin's land claim is one of the largest and most complex in Ontario. Speaker, could the minister please elaborate on the significance of the event that took place on Tuesday? Thank you. Minister. Yes, uh, thank you, Speaker. Yes, Speaker, it was a truly significant event. The uh, signing of a historic agreement in principle between the federal and provincial governments and the Algonquins of Ontario. It marked the start of a new treaty relationship, working together in the spirit of reconciliation to resolve a very long-standing land claim that covers an area of 36,000 square kilometres in eastern Ontario. More than a million people share this land with the Algonquins of Ontario. The historic treaty will provide balance for the rights and interests of all concerned and allow long overdue reconciliation to provide economic opportunities by creating an environment of true partnership with all. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you.
Thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the minister for his response. It's very encouraging to see that the government has worked very hard in partnership with the Algonquins of Ontario and the federal government to reach this very significant milestone. And might I add that we are pleased now that we have a federal party, a federal partner in Ottawa, that cares about Indigenous issues and has actually come to the table. Land claim and treaty negotiations give us the opportunity to resolve long-standing disputes concerning land in a balanced way that respects the rights of Indigenous peoples. It's a remarkable example of reconciliation in action. Speaker, could the minister please tell us what Ontarians should expect from this historic agreement in principle? Thank you. Minister. Yes, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, let me highlight some, just some of the key components to the Algonquin Agreement in principle. The agreement was first shaped by consultation with 10 Algonquin, uh, Algonquin Ontario communities and other Indigenous groups. The agreement sets out the main elements of a settlement, including the Algonquins of Ontario to receive capital funding from Canada and from Ontario, and the transfer of provincial crown land to the Algonquins. Importantly, no privately owned land will be taken away from anyone to settle the claim, and no one will lose access to their private property. Importantly, very importantly, Algonquin Park will remain a park for the enjoyment of all. Wonderful. Speaker, and to members of this chamber, I can tell you that the negotiating parties took great, Answer. great care to craft this agreement. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Any questions? The member from. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you. New question. The member from Simcoe Gray. Speaker, my question is for the uh, Minister of Health. Recently, uh, Mr. Robbie Ross of Collingwood wrote to me to say that he requires knee replacement surgery. Mr. Ross met with his orthopedic surgeon at the Collingwood General Marine Hospital who told him recently that the joint surgery budget is used up for this fiscal year. Mr. Ross is now on a waiting list, and the fiscal year for the surgery budget doesn't start again until April 2017, and Mr. Ross has no idea how long he'll be on that waiting list. Mr. Ross is frustrated, and his surgeon is too. This type of situation is unacceptable, Mr. Speaker. It signifies how the government's wasteful spending, mismanagement, and scandal has harmed our health care sector, and we warned you, Minister and Premier, that this would happen. Speaker, what does this minister have to say to Mr. Ross Question. and many other residents in my riding who have similar stories? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I would say to Mr. Ross that uh, it's important that he uh, work with his local primary care provider, with his specialist. There are some specialists, Mr. Speaker, that have longer wait times than others. Yeah. Uh, the Lynn is in a position, and often does, with individual patients, Mr. Speaker, works with them to find perhaps a specialist, a surgeon, a hospital a nearby that has a shorter wait time. But yeah. it's also the responsibility of that specialist to prioritize. And so those that truly most urgently do require that hip or knee replacement or cataract surgery, it's completely within the realm of that hospital, completely within the realm of that specialist to actually put that person at the top of the list, Mr. Speaker. So we need to make sure that triage is taking place. We need to, as a province, invest as we are $2 billion just to reduce wait times for important procedures. That's what's got us to the top of the list in Canada for the shortest wait times across the board, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, clearly, Mr. Speaker, the government's going to have to do better. Uh, we're only halfway through the fiscal year, and hospital after hospital, surgeon after surgeon has run out of money. Uh, you, you blamed us for not voting for your budget. Well, your budget passed and made things worse, so thank God we didn't vote for it, I say, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Lisa Henderley is a 46-year-old Wasaga Beach resident who needs hip surgery, but like Mr. Ross, she's been told that there's no money left for her procedure, and so she has to wait until at least April 2017. Ms. Henderley says she's in pain. She says it's hard for her to work and do physical activities with her children. And Mr. Speaker, Mrs. Uh, Henderley has a question for the minister, and it's this. If the minister's wife or mother needed to have surgery, but there was no more funding left for them, and they had to wait a year or longer. Question. And he saw them in such pain on a daily basis. Would the minister find this acceptable? 
Thank you. Well, um, wow. thank God, Mr. Speaker, that Mrs. Henderson and her family, that they didn't need that hip surgery 15 years ago when that government was in power, because it would have taken her twice as long, Mr. Speaker. We've reduced the length of time to wait for hip, hip surgery by 50 per cent, Mr. Speaker, since we came uh, into government. And in fact, 86 per cent of Ontarians receive a knee or hip replacement within six months in this province, and that's 7 per cent better than the national average and it's better than almost every jurisdiction around this world. They didn't vote for this budget. They voted against additional investments to further reduce those wait times, Mr. Speaker. And when we came into government, they, had, they didn't even measure it. When we started measuring wait times, they left the worst wait times in this country to us to Answer. fix. We fixed it. We're continuing to do the job. No thanks to you. You see it, please. You see it, please. A reminder that you're a speak to the chair. New question. The member from Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. This week we learned that the Hero Ontario LRT is going to be run by a private company. It will not be run by any public transit agency. The NDP strongly supports the LRT project, but we strongly oppose the government's aggressive push into privatized transit. Privatized transit is more expensive, and since this government refuses to provide funding for local transit operations, we know that Mississauga riders will pay much higher fares. Will the Premier keep Mississauga public transit public by removing maintenance and operations from the scope of the Huron Ontario LRT contract? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, Speaker. I do thank the member opposite for the question and for her interest in this particular project, a project in Peel Region, Speaker, that will help transform not only Mississauga and Southern Brampton, but the entire greater in Toronto and Hamilton area as it relates to building the seamless and integrated transit network that we are committed to build. Speaker, I can tell you, just a couple of days ago, I was very proud to be in Mississauga, at Mississauga City Hall, uh, alongside uh, my colleague, uh, the member from Mississauga East Cooksville, the minister responsible for seniors, the mayor of uh, Mississauga, members of council, uh, and somewhere in the neighbourhood of a couple of hundred residents who were there for an open house on this particular project. Speaker, This, as most members in the House will know, is a project this LRT line along here, Ontario, that will have 22 stops, including three stops within downtown Mississauga. Speaker, it will connect into uh, some of our go corridors. It will connect and support uh, the municipal Answer. aspirations. And as per usual on the transit file, the leader of Ontario's NDP and that particular Thank member you. and that entire caucus are speaker misguided. Thanks. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again, back to the Premier. Uh, the Auditor General found that Ontario's public private partnerships cost $8 billion above base costs. This is equivalent to a 30 per cent cost overrun on every single P3 project. Most of this extra money went to Bay Street and the banks. P3s take longer to build as well. The TTC has a century's worth of experience with surface rail transit and could get the Cure Ontario LRT running in four years. But the government will waste an extra two years just to package this into an investment vehicle for private financiers. Will the Premier save time and hundreds of millions of dollars by keeping this public Question. transit project public? Okay. Uh, thank, thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. I don't. I don't think members in this legislature need to take my word for exactly how transformational the Here Ontario LRT will be, Speaker. In this, uh, in today's, in today's Toronto Star, Speaker, there was a wonderful article entitled "15 Years to Mid-Rise Manhattan." It is all about uh, the renaissance uh, that Mississauga is going through, Speaker. This article in today's Toronto Star. Uh, highlights specifically that this government's LRT project along along here Ontario uh, will uh, will help with a 56 million dollar investment and a brand new Mississauga research and development facility. Speaker, it will lead to along the LRT corridor a planned 166 acre urban farm, including historic farm buildings and about 33 acres of mid-rise residential development, including street level cafes, restaurants, boutiques. And speaker, the article goes on 
to deliver so much more good news. Because we're investing in Mississauga, because we're investing in this LRT, Thank we're you. getting it right. The question is why the Ontario NDP Thank you. I'd like to remind the member that when I stand, you sit. Um, I found that I found that inappropriate. Dismissive. Thank you. New question, the member from Kingston in the audience. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the minister responsible for seniors affairs. Minister, many Ontarians who have lived and contributed to their communities their entire lives are beginning to enter their golden years. Their communities are also growing older, and with that become, comes a new set of challenges. A few weeks ago, you told us about the ambitious Seniors Community Grant Program, which is funding programs for seniors organizations across Ontario. And with our good friend, the Minister of Health, you announced free shingles vaccinations for seniors aged 65 to 70, providing peace of mind and financial to re relief to 850,000 seniors. But even with these important investments, it is still vital to support basic accessibility projects that help seniors continue living in their communities. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Seniors Affairs please inform the House what support the Ontario Seniors Secretariat is providing communities in order to meet the needs of their seniors? Associate Minister, responsible for seniors issues. Uh, and thank you, Speaker. And I'd like to start by thanking the hardworking member from Kingston and the Islands for her question. Mr. Speaker, I'm delighted to update the House and let them know that since becoming the minister responsible for seniors, I've toured the province uh, to learn firsthand how our seniors are benefiting from the programs that this province has created specifically for seniors. One area that I do want to focus on today, Mr. Speaker, is the idea of age-friendly communities. Mm. As Ontario ages, the the one thing Ontarians are telling us is they want to live on their own for as long as they can. And that is why, Mr. Speaker, we are funding 56 communities across Ontario to help them become more age-friendly. Thanks to this program, communities from Ann Pryor to Wawa will now have the tools and knowledge to make their communities easier places for seniors to live in. Answer. Okay. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the minister for her answer. I'm pleased to hear that this government is making investments that help seniors who want to stay in their communities. And I'm proud to be part of a caucus that recognizes the valuable contributions that seniors make to Ontario. As our population ages, it is vital that we make these investments today in order to accommodate the needs of tomorrow. And by sharing experience and guidance with local communities, we eliminate messy or ineffective guesswork. I am, however, still very interested to hear how the Senior Secretariat helps communities prepare for the future needs of seniors. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please inform the House about the specific supports that are offered to communities who are working to become age-friendly? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Again, I want to thank uh, the member for her very important question, and I'm happy to speak to more specifically to, as to what we are doing around age-friendly communities. In 2013, as you may know, Mr. Speaker, we released the Age-Friendly Community Planning Guide, which offers age-friendly planners a great deal of resources. In 2014, we launched the Age-Friendly Community Planning Grant, which provides $1.5 million to 56 communities across Ontario. Let me give you some examples of the communities we are funding. As my uh, neighbour, the MPP and uh, for Ottawa Orleans just reminded me, the City of Ottawa has received funding to help develop a plan to install automatic doors in city buildings and add benches to parks and roadways. In Hamilton, this program has improved accessibility to retail centres and raised awareness about Answer. services for seniors. So, Mr. Speaker, here are some examples of how we are making Ontario age-friendly one city at a time. Thank you. Thank you. Question, the member from the Thank you much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Ottawa resident Lisa Garland has three beautiful children, and two of them have cancer. Oh. If that's not horrific and stressful enough, Lisa tells me that the injections alone cost $3,000 a month, the anti-vomiting drugs cost over $800 a month, and that's not all. 
Special food, taking time off work, and parking at the hospital added up for Lisa and her family. They were forced to fundraise. Uh, which is why I think Ontario needs a compassionate and catastrophic care plan for our patients in exceptional circumstances like Lisa Garland's family. Uh, Minister, a top priority for all Ontarians is health care. I just want you to be part of this plan, and I'm hoping that you agree with me that Lisa's family shouldn't be fundraising for her children with cancer. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question. I do with, agree with you that. Uh, uh, there are families, uh, regrettably, uh, often uh, um, it's too common, families that are facing uh, catastrophic situations, particularly when they uh, involve children. They're uh, difficult, I think, for all of us to imagine just uh, how challenging that can be for a family to, uh, to cope with and manage. Uh, we do in the province, as the member opposite does know, we do have a, a catastrophic drug program that does provide uh, support uh, to families, including families with children, uh, for a variety of uh, medical and drug challenges that they uh, might face. Uh, it is uh, an important program which has provided, I think, uh, together um, with other uh, programs offered by the province, it does provide a degree of support which is reassuring to a lot of families that do find themselves regrettably and unfortunately in that Answer. extremely challenging and difficult situation. Thank you. I appreciate uh, the words from the minister, but I, I think that we could be doing more because more and more people are maxing out their credit cards, they're setting up GoFundMe campaigns, or they're doing other fundraising events. Others rely on the generosity of drug companies. Brian Monty and his wife Erica also live near Ottawa. His wife has multiple melanoma and incurable cancer from blood plasma. She's undergone a stem cell transplant and was prescribed Revlum and it has kept her alive for three years. Private medical insurance covers up to $100,000 a year, but that runs out by September, leaving $36,000 that they're left at the mercy of the drug company for the rest of the year. Um, this year, that's changed, and Brian is afraid his wife might die without the drug. And that is why Ontario needs a compassionate and catastrophic care plan. She's only alive at the mercy of a drug company. Question. Will the minister take the lead on this today, and will you support my motion for a compassionate and catastrophic care plan for the province of Ontario? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I appreciate the clarification at the end, because this is actually about the member's private member's bill uh, or motion this afternoon, which I think I do understand that it, it actually goes quite beyond what we've been discussing, at least in the first aspect. It talks about creating a fund to fund experimental treatment for individuals. And, and I think Ontarians appreciate the fact that we do have Trillium, which does provide support for individuals and families that uh, do uh, uh, find themselves in catastrophic or extremely challenging, financially challenging situations. But we also uh, fund, um, and 96 per cent of the applicants that come forward many, many thousands, we do fund um, uh, um, uh, treatments for them and procedures for them that may not be available in uh, this province. I know the private member's bill that the, the uh, member opposite referenced at the very end actually speaks largely about a different fund, which is to fund experimental treatment. We need to make sure that, Thanks, our, that our funding is focused on, focused on evidence, best clinical practice, and guided, quite frankly, by the specialists that should be making this decision in the first place. Yeah. Thank you. Question the member from Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last month, I began collecting hydro bills from my constituents to show the Premier what the reality is for hydro users in Ontario. Families in my community are at a breaking point, and I have got over 100 bills sitting here on my desk to prove it. While dropping their bills off, I've heard from families and seniors in Oshawa that set alarms to do their laundry in the middle of the night and lower their food budget just to keep the lights on. This is the reality in my community. Will the Premier offer real solutions to hydro users in Oshawa, or should we just continue living in the dark? Premier. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm very pleased, uh, pleased to rise and answer the question from the uh, member of the opposition. Um, it is important for us as a party to ensure that we do put programs in place to help families um, like those in Oshawa, like those in, in all parts of the province, Mr. Speaker. And that's why yesterday I was so pleased to see that um, our bill that helping families with the 8 percent reduction passed through this House unanimously, Mr. Speaker. I think that's very important. We also have the OESP program, which I know, Mr. Speaker, 
helps families save up to $45 a month. And in some cases, if they qualify, Mr. Speaker, if they have uh, a medical condition that they need to use equipment for, they can get up to $75 a month. And some other good news that's going to help families, Mr. Speaker, is, is yesterday. The Ontario Energy Board has announced that uh, residential and small business electricity prices will not increase, Mr. Speaker, um, for the next six-month period. Wow. So we've got the OEB uh, as a quasi-judicial organization, uh, you know, making sure that they're protecting Ontario ratepayers as well, Mr. Speaker. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And back to the Premier. Under the Liberal government, hydro bills have nearly quadrupled since 2003, and it's Ontarians that have been forced to pay for Liberal mismanagement and mistakes. While dropping a hydro bill off at my office, a constituent named Jeff told me that his plan for the winter is to turn his thermostat down to 62 degrees and rely on a heavy housecoat and warm slippers. Again, this is the reality in my community. Will the Premier commit to lowering hydro rates in Ontario, or should my constituents just keep turning the thermostat down instead? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, again, thanks for the supplementary question. And I think the important thing that uh, we can tell all of our constituents, uh, constituents is, as of January 1st, rates will be going down in this province by 8 percent, Mr. Speaker. That's something that I know this government is very proud of, Mr. Speaker, because we recognize, Mr. Speaker, that some folks are having a difficult time when it comes to paying their electricity bills. We understand that, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we acted. We had to do all the heavy lifting, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that we have a clean, safe, reliable system. And we've done that, Mr. Speaker. We've got the OESP program. Finish, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, to ensure that they have the OESP program, there's the LEAP program in place, Mr. Speaker. And as I mentioned, we've also uh, eliminated the debt retirement charge, and we're also making sure that come January 1st, that they will actually have an 8% reduction on their bills, Mr. Speaker. We're doing a lot to help families right across the province. New question, the member from Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, speaker, uh, my question is for the Minister of Transportation. We all know that school buses carry a precious cargo, and when a parent or a caregiver waves goodbye to a child stepping onto a school bus, they want to know that their child will have a safe ride to and from school. Ontario is known for the safety of its roads, and I know the minister reminds us how often that our roads are among the safest in Ontario. Speaker, we all know when it comes to the safety of our children, Ontarians need an extra sense of security that safety is our top priority. Speaker. Would the minister please let the members of this House know what our government is doing to ensure the safety of children on school buses, not only, on t not only today, but for years to come? Great. Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member from Ottawa South for the question. Of course, Speaker, this is something that I, as the Minister of Transportation, do think about year-round, but it is particularly at the forefront of my mind this week as it is School Bus Safety Week. The member from Ottawa South is absolutely correct. Parents and all caregivers deserve the extra assurance that at the end of the day, a school day, their child will return home safe and sound. That's why I'm proud to say <coughs> that school bus transportation is the safest form of transport for school children in Ontario. According to research by Transport Canada, traveling on a school bus is 16 times safer than traveling in a regular motor vehicle based on the number of passengers and kilometres travelled. Speaker, we'll continue to work diligently on this file because our government is committed to continually improving school bus safety and we want to ensure all families that safety will always be a top priority for our government. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for the answer to the question. Uh, our government, uh, and indeed everyone in this legislature, is committed to the safety of our children, not only when they're in our schools, but also when they're on the road to get there. Transporting over 800,000 students a day is a huge safety responsibility, and I know that families in my community and communities across Ontario will be reassured, reassured by the safety record of school buses in this province. It is especially critical for all of us to have the opportunity to talk about the importance of public awareness in ensuring the, safety, uh, the, the success of safety campaigns like School Bus Safety Week. Mr. Speaker, would the minister please be able to provide members of this House with any additional information on the importance of School Bus Safety Week? Thank you, Minister. Thanks very much, Speaker. Again, I thank the member from Ottawa South for the follow-up question. I want to start off by saying that I'm extremely uh, pleased, as always, to work alongside uh, many of our ongoing, uh, ongoing safety partners in all aspects of road user safety. Uh, speaker, uh, and these campaigns, the campaigns that our partners are responsible for developing and delivering alongside MTO, are critical drivers with respect to raising public awareness about road safety 
and issues specifically around school bus safety. Speaker. School Bus Safety Week sees such success stories because there are organizations in the province of Ontario that care as much about the safety of our roads as we do. Speaker. This is another great example of how we can make Ontario stronger by working together. So, Speaker, it's my privilege to say to the member from Ottawa South and, of course, to all of our road safety partners how grateful we at MTO are for their extraordinary work, and I look forward to having the chance to work alongside them for many years to come. Thanks very much, Speaker. Thank you. And the question the member from Oxford. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Premier, I've heard from hundreds of people about the hardships caused by their hydro bills. They've told me their stories and wanted me to ask the Premier for her response. One pensioner said he has to work two part-time jobs just to make ends meet because of the hydro increases. His wife is on disability. He has said he wants to stay in his own home and not be forced to move at his age. But the price of hydro is making this harder and harder. The government assistance programs aren't solving the problem. What does the Premier have to say to this pensioner working two jobs just to pay his hydro bill? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the uh, honourable member for the question. And it is very important for us on this side of the house to ensure that all all families, all seniors know the programs that are available. And one of the important things uh, that we do have, Mr. Speaker, is the OESP program. And I know I talk about it often, but the one section of the OESP program uh, gives seniors uh, up to $75 a month, Mr. Speaker. Um, I hope that uh, they've, this, this senior has contacted his local LDC to find out what he qualifies for, Mr. Speaker, because that, 70, that $75 I know can go a long way when you put that on top of the things that we've already done, Mr. Speaker, to help, uh, making sure that uh, you know we've got we've eliminated the debt retirement charge which is a $70 uh, a year piece mr. speaker as well on top of the 8% that he will see on his uh, on his bills mr. speaker uh, come January 1st so we Answer. recognize that some families and some seniors are having a hard time with those bills mr. speaker and that's why we acted and we're very proud that that bill passed yesterday mr. speaker supplementary well mr. speaker if the premier cares I think my constituents would like to hear her response the rebate and assistance programs that the minister sp speaks about are not enough. Another story I received comes from a senior who lives on a fixed income in a mobile home that is 12 by 60 feet. Since 2010, her hydro rates have increased by 150 per cent. After paying for hydro each month, she only has $57 left to cover the cost of food. Soon, she will have to make difficult choices between eating and paying for her prescription drugs. What does the Premier have to say to this senior who is choosing between paying for hydro or basic necessity? And I'd like to hear that, Mr. Speaker, from the Premier. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I do again uh, acknowledge that uh, you know uh, the, the the question from the honourable member and the importance of making sure that there are programs in place to to help families and to help individuals, Mr. Speaker, with their electricity bills. We have done a lot of the heavy lifting, Mr. Speaker. We've invested in making sure that we can uh, you know have a clean, safe, reliable system, Mr. Speaker. I've talked about the OESP program, Mr. Speaker. You know what? In in his in his writing, Mr. Speaker, I hope he's talking about the OESP program. And also talking about the Ontario Energy and Property Tax Credit that these families and individuals can apply for, Mr. Speaker. If they need help, Mr. Speaker, right away in an emergency situation, we have the uh, the LEAP program, Mr. Speaker. Families can even make sure, Mr. Speaker, that they can apply for the Save on Energy program. Conservation, Mr. Speaker, helps them reduce our bills and helps the overall supply, Mr. Speaker. It's a very important Answer. program and something very key for families to be part of, Mr. Speaker. We have many programs that are in place. Eight percent coming you. January first, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Leeds Grenville has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport concerning the Ontario Trillium Foundation. This matter will be debated next Tuesday at 6 p.m. The, the point of order from the member from Ottawa South. Speaker, I'd like to correct my record. I, I believe in my initial question I said we had the safest roads in Ontario. What I meant to say was the safest roads in North America. Thank you. Thank you. It is a point of order, and all members are free to correct their own record. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.